<coughs> uh, so this is, can everybody hear me? Yes. Can anybody not hear me? I guess if you couldn't hear me, you couldn't answer that, could you? So, <laughs> probably not the right question. <laughs> so it's a full house for fear, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Actually, many years ago, there was a book called uh, The Age of Anxiety. Somebody called him, this is the age of anxiety, the age of worry. Uh, so uh, there is a reason uh, why, why we are here. Uh, it was uh, nice to come in and see... Uh, uh, has this been explained who this is up here sitting on the altar? Uh, this is uh, actually uh, Bodhidharma. Uh, Bodhidharma was a Indian uh, master uh, who is uh, historically uh, uh, considered the uh, father of Zen. He was Indian and he came to China in around the 8th century and the uh, practices and the teachings uh, he brought with him uh, in time became known as in China as Chan, and which was then in Japanese known as Zen. Uh, but Bodhidharma, uh, as opposed to uh, Shakyamuni Buddha, Buddha above him, was very sweet. He's very peaceful, very calm. Uh, Bodhidharma, you know, has another look to him. Uh, no nonsense here. I could say more, but uh, this is being recorded. Uh, yeah, so Bodhi Bodhidharma, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, he's not angry. Don't consider that angry. He's fearless. And uh, that look he gives is he just looks uh, and nothing scares him because he looks directly at things and th sees things as they are. And Bodhidharma was his own man. Actually, it is said that uh, when he first came to, uh, uh, to China, uh, and the, mas uh, the emperor, uh, Emperor Wu, who was uh, uh, a great uh, supporter of Buddhism, uh, when he had heard about uh, this new Indian master, who had showed up and was seemed to be having uh, some renown, uh, he invited him to come to the, uh, to the palace. And uh, when uh, Bodhidharma uh, was invited, uh, they had a very famous interchange. Uh, I won't go into it now because we're here for something else, uh, but basically uh, he just uh, pulled the rug out of the uh, emperor. I mean, this is the emperor of China. And he just pulled the rug out of him. I mean, the, 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 he, uh, he basically, uh, the emperor thought he was quite a good Buddhist uh, because he uh, supported uh, temples and he had sutras printed, texts printed, and uh, just quite of a wonderful guy. And uh, Bodhidharma let him know that was worthless, <laughs> uh, th that kind of practice. Uh, and the, then Bodhidharma, so not only uh, did he have an opportunity to uh, gain great favor with the emperor and was willing to walk away from that, uh, but then he sort of thought uh, these Chinese, uh, even though there was a large uh, 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 practice of Buddhism at this uh, non-meditative way uh, in China, uh, he sees after talking to the emperor, I guess, some others, he felt these people are just not ready. And then he, uh, he retired to a mountain, uh, Shaolin, which is famous for uh, now the martial arts. Uh, but uh, and that's how somehow Bodhidharma is tied into and his meditative tradition and Chan is tied into the martial arts uh, but he retired to a cave on, on Shaolin Mountain uh, where supposedly he spent nine years just meditating in a cave and uh, people would come and ask him to teach and he wouldn't teach them he didn't think they were ready then after nine years he began to teach but he was uh, he was a human being, he was true to himself. He didn't curry to uh, a public favor, he didn't care what people thought of him or didn't think of him, he didn't seek renown or fame or uh, celebrity, uh, he was uh, fearless in, uh, in uh, following his own truth. Uh, so because of that I thought it'd be nice to have him uh, with us. Uh, but we also have the Buddha showing the other aspect.
Um, so this is a uh, short retreat, three-day retreat. Uh, actually, uh, today, tomorrow uh, are only full days, really. Uh, so we got to jump right in. Uh, so for those of you who are uh, kind of, uh, you know, you know, like on the shore, just kind of dipping your little toe, kind of. You know, by the time, by the, by the time you get above your knees, the, the retreat will be over. <laughs> okay? You know, there are a lot of people going to the water like that. Uh, and a lot of that is fear. We don't want to jump right in, do we? We're scared of what might be there. Maybe too cold. There may be icky things in there. You know, who knows? We may be uncomfortable. Uh, so uh, it's like that. Uh, we bring uh, we bring our fears, our anxieties, our approach to life uh, wherever we go. Uh, so uh, again, uh, you have two days now. Everybody is here, I am sure, because somehow uh, fear and the composting of fear uh, and the transformation of fear into fearlessness uh, somehow speaks to you in a very pertinent way. Uh, some, it has been a uh, somewhat of an issue. Uh, some, it's in specific areas of your life where it's an issue. And some, it may have been a long-term chronic issue. You do not have to live in fear. You do not have to live in worry. Worry and fear is the product of a diseased mind. We need to understand that clearly. Okay, and I don't say that in any critical way. I, said, I, I would say that in the same way uh, that if you went to the doctor and you weren't feeling well, uh, he would tell you, oh, it's because uh, you're sick. That's why you don't feel well. You're sick. You know? And if you didn't have this uh, sickness, if you didn't have this disease, uh, you would feel good. You would be well, right? And we like to hear that, don't we? Uh, the, the problem is when it comes to our mind, uh, we don't have any criteria for health. Is that clear? So we, 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 we think, uh, you know, uh, anxieties and fears and sadnesses and resentments and angers and all, all these kinds of things are kind of, as long as they don't get too out of hand, right? As long as we don't become too dysfunctional, as long as we don't act out too much, as long as we can continue to function with this stuff, uh, but even though it's uh, often episodic or chronic in our mind, uh, we think, uh, it's okay. I'm doing well. Why? Because everybody else is, has the same problem. <laughs> right? so, so we think we're normal. And we may even think we're better than other people because, you know, they're, they're really out of, out of whack. <laughs> You don't meet healthy people in the hospital, my friends. Don't compare yourself to all the other sick people on the ward. Is that clear? The Buddha, through his own life, demonstrated the capacity of all of us to be healthy, to be mentally healthy to have healthy minds. A healthy mind is a mind free of all the emotional afflictions, free of distorted thinking. That is a healthy mind. So please understand, when we are worrying, when we are scared, when we are anxious, when we are angry, when we are resentful, right? When we're given into despair, or we are sick in those moments. Our mind is not healthy in those moments. And we need to approach the ill health of our minds in the same way we approach the ill health of our bodies. And you know we are very concerned about our bodies, don't we? We don't like getting sick, do we? We don't like how we feel, right? So we take, you know, we, we work out and we exercise and we eat 
uh, natural organic foods and right and we take supplements and vitamins and you know right why so we can have healthy bodies so we can feel well so we won't get sick and when we're sick what do we do we take something or go to the health practitioner because we want to what we don't like being sick we want to get well we want to feel good again don't we yeah it's it's the 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 the, the sickness and the well-being of our body is uppermost in our mind right i mean when when we we, we, we run into each other how are you feeling right and and most of us respond in terms of our body I'm not feeling too well these days, or some, I may be coming down with something, right? No, I'm feeling good, you know. It's always about our body. But the most essential characteristic of our life and our well-being is what? Our minds. Much more important. If you have a healthy body but a sick mind, you will not be happy. If you have a healthy mind and a sick body, you can still be happy. Is that clear? That is the great uh, power of the Buddhist teaching because it relates directly to the mind. All afflictions arise in the mind, the Buddha said. Nowhere else. Whose mind? My mind. I don't need to be concerned about anybody else's mind. So those of you here at retreat who are still watching everybody else, seeing how everybody else is doing, stop it. Okay. <laughs> There's only one mind when you're on retreat that you need to be concerned about. Whose mind is that, Candace? Mine. Mine, man. Candace only got to watch one person's mind. You see how easy that is? Right. I don't know, there are 46, 48 people at retreat. I mean, if you had to watch 48 minds, that'd be a lot of work. You say, wow, this is going to be a difficult retreat. I got to keep, I got to keep track of everybody's mind state, how they're doing, but you know. But you don't have to do that. There's only one mind you need to keep track of, and that's your mind. There's only one mind, and all you need to do at retreat is what? Watch it. Just watch it. And during the retreat, you will get lots of help in terms of how to understand what's going on and change what's going on. But that's going to be your focus, no matter what you're doing. Right? Whether you're in the meditation hall, whether you're eating, whether you're walking around outside, just watch your mind. Right? I mean, what could be easier? Since it's your own mind. Light. <laughs> now, uh, because uh, watching our mind, observing our mind, and when we're talking about our mind, we're talking about what? Thoughts, feelings, emotions. Ideas, you know, the whole realm. The, that is our mind. That's the activity of our, that's the activity of our mind. Is that is that clear? That's that's what we're watching. We're attending to the the way the the feelings, especially with fear. Fear is a nice feeling. That's a good thing about fear. Right? You you know when it's present, right? Because it has a very specific uh, emotional coloration when it arises. And you know uh, that fear has a very specific kind of thinking, right? It worries about things. It's concerned about things, isn't it? And there is an uneasiness in the body, body-mind. So we are going to be watching observing our minds, our thoughts, and our feelings, and we're going to be looking into what's underneath it, what supports it. 
Now to do that, we need to what? We need to calm. Right? Calm. We do that first by practicing mindfulness. Now hopefully, again, so we don't have a lot of time, you know, this is not a seven day retreat where people can pace themselves. Actually, last week in Tampa, I was saying, uh, uh, you know, practitioners of the dharmas have to be marathon runners, you know, long term, don't be sprinters, or you'll burn out. You'll have to always be putting out short bursts of energy, and then you'll be uh, uh, tired, and you're bored, or whatever. So, uh, you know, we want to be long term, but uh, this retreat is a sprint. <laughs> Okay, you got to. You got to. You gotta, <laughs> this is this is this is a sprint. Okay, everybody's got to, uh, you know, start out and just and just do it for two days. Is that is that clear? Okay. So we need to begin by calming the waters, right? Calming the waters of the mind. We do that by mindfulness. Mindfulness, don't make a big deal about it. You know, people turn these things into big deals. You know, something, mm, i got to master that. You don't have to master mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is simply the capacity to be present. We all have that capacity. When we were little children, that's all we could do. It was simple. Little children are just always present. Right? They don't have any past, they don't have any future, they don't have any thought, they're not, they don't have any identity, they're just present. They see, they smell, they hear, they taste, right? And their emotions are very simple. Everybody in here was a child, whether you remember it or not. So that capacity we all have to be present is simply a capacity of mind that's always present uh, and is still present, but we have forgotten it because we have been lost in what? In the world of conceptualization, we're always thinking, thinking about the past, thinking about the present, thinking about the future, worrying about this, uh, angry about that, uh, anticipating this, expecting that, ruminating about, right? Because of that, uh, we are not even capable of just being present to what's in front of us. So the first thing, that's why, you know, first rule is what? No past, no future, just this. What could be simpler than that? The past is gone. The future hasn't come. Right? Would anybody disagree with me that at this moment, this is all we have? We're all right here, sitting in this room, talking with each other? Is there anybody who doesn't, right? So we all agree, this is a consensual reality. It's called, this is called consensual reality. We all agree that right now, in our life, we are all alive right here, right now, in this room. Is that clear? There's nobody who misunderstands that. Okay. So in the same way you know that, all we want to do your best for the next two days is to remember that and just live that, to stay here, right? to stay here. Don't wander in the past, don't wander into the future, don't wander into conceptualization and fantasy, and just do your best to stay here. That's why we practice body, breath, you know, these other uh, practices to help us. That's why when we walk, we just walk. When we eat, we just eat. We're just present. It doesn't mean that thoughts may not arise and disappear. They do. Same way words come and go, and sounds come and go, and sights. Just don't get distracted. Don't get hooked. Okay. Mindfulness calms. Then the concentration on the breath calms even more. Okay. So we practice mindfulness, but then we really kind of hone in on whatever we're doing in our meditation, in our walking, and that what? Calms the mind even more. Why do we want to calm the mind? It's not just because it feels better than agitation, which it does. 
In Buddhism, this path, we calm the mind because when the mind is calmer and there's more clearer, I can see. What do I want to see? I want to see the way things really are. And in this retreat, we want to see what? Fear. What is this all about? Is that clear? So this is very important because for many of us, fear is something that has driven us. Fear is something that we don't like. Fear is something we're uncomfortable with. Fear is something we don't like to talk about. Fear is stuff we're embarrassed to have. I mean, fear, fear, right? And I'm going to say to you, fear is the path to fearlessness. Fear is the path to fearlessness. No longer turning away, no longer denying, no longer repressing, no longer distracting, no longer numbing, and no longer giving in to. Right? Fear is the path to fearlessness. In Buddhism, they say there are 84,000 Dharma doors. I'll leave it to people who are a little obsessive compulsive to really count them all. Uh, When a Dharma door is a door to enter the truth, to enter the Dharma. 84,000 Dharma doors means what? Everything. Anything that is penetrated brings you into the truth. Right? So you want to be fearless, Penetrate the fear. In that fear, you will find your fearlessness. Nowhere else. So that is why we need, first of all, mindfulness and and this capacity uh, to calm the mind, right? So we can watch fear. And it's comp- I mean, its components, right? The, the worrying thoughts, the stories, the imagination, uh, the feelings, cessations in the body, right? Just like that, right? undisturbed, like a like a scientist, like an investigator. You're just curious. Right? Please be over these next days very curious about fear. We have spent our life running from it or being driven by it. And now we're going to be like Bodhidharma. We're just going to stop. Right? Many people all their life, they felt like somebody's chasing them. Somebody's after them and they got to, you know, and they're worried. Right? Everybody know that feeling? That's anxiety. It's always kind of haunting. Something bad's going to happen. Something bad's going to happen, right? Can't handle that. What if that happens? What if this happens? What if it happens to me or someone else? I can't handle that. Overwhelmed by that, right? People have been chased by that. Fear of death. Fear of getting sick. Fear of dying. Fear of other people dying. It's always been chasing you. what we do is, rather than keep running, (laughs) we just stop. Like Bodhidharma. See how his eyes are like, just like that. Right? He doesn't have that kind of, you know, that meditative downward glance. Look at him. His eyes are like that. He's just looking right at it. Is that clear? He's just looking right at it. That's what that that's what that signifies. He's looking right at it, whatever it is. Fear, anger, delusion, whatever it is. He stopped. He's not running. He's not running, right? He's not moving. And he's just looking right at it. What is it? Please be curious. For those of you who have been driven by fears and anxieties and worries for much of your life. 
today you're going to stop and you're just going to look at it. You may be surprised that that which has terrified you your whole life, worried you your whole life, may not be what you always thought it was. But how would you ever know if you don't stop and if you don't look right at it? So mindfulness, concentration, is that capacity to stop. Thich Nhat Hanh calls it stopping. We need to stop. For those of you who have been running, it's time to stop. Stand your ground. I mean that differently than Governor Scott. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to stand our ground. Are there any questions about what I've said so far? Yeah, it's so easy, isn't it? Okay. Uh, So, calm, clear, relaxed, eyes wide open, mindful, okay? And in your mindfulness, you have this objectivity, right? This equanimity. Equanimity means what? Right? Equal. So, in equanimity, in, in mindfulness, there's no judgment, good, bad, right, wrong, would want, would not want, right? You know, many of us also, in terms of emotions, uh, in terms of thoughts, you know, we go, I like these, I don't like these, these are good ones, bad, we're always trying to get ones in and get the other ones out, right? In mindfulness, we don't have to do that. In awareness, you don't have to do that, you just look at it. Right? And for those of you who've been around a while, you know I say that the mind of a meditator is, uh, is somebody who's like the mind of a researcher. Right? A researcher is what? It's like a scientist, right? They're just, uh, you, know, you know, they want to see, they have a, a, a hypothesis or something that they want to understand, and they're very willing in their collection of data just to what? I mean, if they're biased in any way, they're, they're, they're not good researchers, right? They're not good investigators. They have to be willing to gather all the information, right? objectively. And then at the end, come to conclusions, right? So in your, in your deep looking, you want to just be uh, impartial, objective investigators into your own mind and experience, whatever it is. Your past, your issues, you know, uh, oh curious, curious, interested, no, no big deal, no, no self choosing, oh, oh, I don't want to admit this about me, or I don't like that, or I'm embarrassed to admit this about myself, you know, it's none of that. We're open to everything. We're just, because we want to, we want to understand. We want to understand uh, who and what we are. We want to understand, in this case, fear and and uh, what, you know, you know how it arises in me and what causes it to rise in me and and uh, you know you know where is it coming from and what are the sources of it, right? And to do that, we need this clear mind, but a mind that is very objective. So, can you see how they build upon one another? You need the mindfulness, you need the calmness, you need the clarity, so you can be, approach your looking directly into yourself, into these feelings and thoughts and things, all these fears and anxieties and worries uh, without being disturbed. You're just watching. Uh, the third thing uh, is to uh, generate compassion. Now, in Buddhism, compassion does not mean uh, simply empathy. Uh, actually, in, uh, the word karuna uh, is usually uh, interpreted as uh, wanting to free someone from their suffering. That's compassion. Compassion is not just empathy. 
Uh, empathy, just so I can, I can feel your pain. Well, that's nice to know. I mean, it's not very helpful, but uh, it's, it's nice to know you feel my pain. Right? Compassion means I feel your pain. Is there anything I can do to help relieve you of it? Is that clear? So when we're generating, when I say generate compassion, it means to understand clearly that your history of fear, anxiety, worry, terror, whatever it is, is suffering. Right? It is ill health of the mind. And when you name it as suffering, not just another kind of mind state that's kind of normal, if it doesn't get too extreme, but it is suffering. Why is it suffering? Because it robs you of your, of your well-being, of your balance, of your equanimity, of your capacity to deal with situations uh, cleanly and objectively and fully and respond appropriately, right? Because when you're worried, uh, all you're concerned about is what? What? Yourself. Me, 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 me. We can't see clearly. We can't really see the situation clearly. We can't see other people clearly. We're only concerned about ourselves. So we have to see that our anxieties, our worries, our fears are a kind of illness. They are suffering. And out of your compassion, you want to what? You want to free yourself from suffering. We say that, don't we? Oh, we say that all the time. And then we go home and we just continue the same garbage we've been throwing at life, right? Indulging ourselves with eh, our petty angers and our resentments and our fears and our hurts and our disappointments and our, right? And yet we say what? I want to be free of suffering. I want to be happy. I want to have an open heart. Right? I want to be a compassionate human being. Right? We also, I, mean, I would imagine everybody here says things like that. And yet if we're truthful and if we watch our behavior, <laughs> and we watch our thoughts, we realize what? That's not true. Is it? <clears throat> the desire to be free of suffering and to know that you have the capacity to do it uh, is a very powerful energy. It can be more powerful uh, than your habit energy. Selflessness can be more powerful than selfishness. Why is that? Because when we are selfish, when we are only thinking about ourselves and our own happiness, does that really make us happy? Think about it. When we're only self-concerned, only concerned about ourselves, trying to manipulate every situation so I can be happy, does that make me happy? No, it may be momentarily when it works out my way, I am, uh, but it doesn't create any kind of lasting happiness, does it? Yeah. But when we are compassionate, uh, when we are helpful in relieving someone's suffering, when we extend loving kindness to another human being, how do we feel? We feel really happy. There's a, there's a feeling, a good feeling inside. We all know that, right? See, there's the proof. So this uh, capacity to generate compassion uh, toward oneself, to want to really free oneself from suffering so one can be happy and that one can really therefore be able to enter life, enter relationships uh, in a very different way than we always have is, is a very powerful motivation. And it is a better gener it is a it is a better motivation than uh, selfishness. So, any, any questions? Mm -hmm. you, you talk about things that are normal and uh, 
and not normal. And you present that fear is not a normal state. You don't have to be in it. Right. But yesterday we had um, an opportunity to go around the room and everybody has fears. Has fears. No, Alex, if you go in the hospital and you say, is anybody sick in here? What would happen? Everybody raise their hand. Yeah, I get it. You haven't gotten it yet. What's the message? Now, hopefully the doctors and the nurses aren't sick. Why? Why do you hope that? Because hopefully somebody in here knows how to, knows how to help the people who are sick. Right? If everybody raises their hand in there, you know, I, I mean, if, if I was one of those patients, I'd say, i got to find another hospital. <laughs> right? You know? Right? No. You, you know, if you're sick and you look around the room and somebody's, and, and, there, and there are some people who say, no, I'm not sick, I'm healthy, and I'm here to help you, that should make you feel what? There's hope. Yeah. I didn't say healthy, I said normal. No. That, yeah, yeah, and I'm saying in a hospital, sick people is normal. The, the, we, we have to understand the revolutionary nature of, of, of um, you know, and, and Buddhism isn't the only one, but I mean, uh, the Buddha showed another way of what it meant, means to be a human being, right? I mean, we, we understand it is a different way. It's a different sense of what it means to be a human being, a different sense of, uh, of, of, of what life's about, of values, of meaning, purpose, yeah. And, uh, yeah. You as a doctor should know that. Well, I agree with everything you said, Fred, apart from the fact that that's not normal. It's a better way, but it's not normal in our society. It's a sick society. Okay. I'll hand you that one. In our society, you have normal. Good. <laughs> you know, I take, I take my cues from this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, who, yeah who, who do we take our cues from? Who are our models? Who are our mentors? That's very important, you know? You know, if our model of society are uh, our, uh, politician, hedge fund managers, I mean, I don't, you know, what else, you know? Uh, you know, if that's normal, uh, you know, our, our, our path in life will be go one way. Right? If consumerism and celebrity and superficiality and all that and fame and acquisition, you know, if that is, if that is the goal, uh, for some people, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, one has to decide, who, who, who are my mentors? The reason we, we put up little things like this is not to, uh, you know, is not to indulge in idol worship or anything. It's to remind us, oh, you know, these remind us of enlightenment, right? Of enlightened beings, of people who have freed themselves from suffering and lead full, rich, happy lives. And they don't even have bank accounts. They don't even have, uh, you know, IRAs. Right? How do they do it? All the things that we're told that we need to be happy and to feel safe, they don't have. Who's happier? I remember when I went in the years when I was traveling in Asia and India and Nepal and Tibet. You know the happiest people I met? Well, were the people living up in caves. It was incredible. You know, I go up to these and, and visit these retreat communities, living up in caves. I mean, really, caves, you know. And they'd be all around these sacred mountains, uh, hundreds of them. Everyone, big, you run into them, big smile. Big smile, you know. Come knocking on the door of their cave, come on in, offer your tea. I mean, it was, you know. I mean, they had nothing in, that, that, that in our world would be considered worthwhile. And they were happy. So that tells us something. What did they have? They had Dharma. Dharma is not a thing. They practice mindfulness, they practice concentration, they practice insight, the same things we practice. Uh, 
uh, when I was speaking to uh, Angie and uh, Diane um, uh, about retreat, uh, and, and they're going to be doing a lot of the guided meditations, I said to them, uh, you know, you know, lots of things you can read about fear. I mean, has anybody here ever read any bad thing about fear, by the way? <laughs> I mean, right? Uh, Candace goes, God. <laughs> I, Candace could write the book, right? I mean, we, you know, people I write. Library. I get a library. I mean, we, you know, we, you know, we, 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 the fears and the, and the, and the, the acronyms and, uh, you know, all the things, uh, you know, that, you know, uh, right? We, we, we've heard the talks, we, you know what I mean? And yet, here we are. Why is that? Why is that? Why doesn't it get below this, into this? Okay. So what I said to them was, uh, uh, it's fine, you know, any kind of uh, reading or whatever you've done about fear, uh, but the most important thing is please uh, reflect on your own experience with fear and how fear has uh, ar arisen in your own life. And if you've dealt with it, what worked? What worked? Because then there's something to share that has authenticity to it. And it is fairly simple. So uh, that caused me to uh, do something I usually don't do, uh, which was to think about my own experience with fear. I thought afterwards, well, it's only fair. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, and, and usually I don't, I don't go down this road, but I thought, well, it's only fair that if I ask them to uh, look at their experience, that I look at my own. So last night I reflected on it. So I wanted to want to share, uh, because I think it's interesting, uh, uh, one's journey. Uh, the first thing that came to mind was uh, when I was three years old, uh, I had polio. Uh, uh, this was pre-vaccination. Uh, and uh, so I was only three years old, and uh, it was interesting because I have memories of it. And, uh, and I know uh, these days in hospitals they do a lot uh, for little children who are sick, uh, so they, uh, you know, won't be afraid, you know, and won't be... And yet, when I reflected back on my experience, I don't ever remember being afraid. It's interesting how a child's mind really is. And I mean, I was taken from my home in an ambulance. In those days, uh, you were quarantined. So I was immediately separated from my family. I was put into a ward. Uh, you know, uh, I remember my parents, uh, it must have been on the first floor, they could look in a window at me. And I remember looking out at them. Hi. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but my ex my experience was just uh, just being there. You know, there was no fear, there was no despair, there was just uh, I think a child's mind is very open and free. And then uh, I was taken to another hospital for rehab for months. And in those days, your parents could only visit you once a week. I mean, very different times. So I spent months, uh, you know, uh, alone. Uh, I didn't have any fear. I wasn't worried about my condition. I wasn't worried how it was going to turn out or what it was going to happen or, you know, how I would deal with it or, right? Why not? Because I was just present. Right? And whatever it was, it was, and I was just dealing with it. Right? And there were other kids around and, you know. I guess the doctors and the nurses were, were kind. Uh, but all my experiences were benign. A complete absence of fear. Uh, in a situation that many people, uh, because we fear illness, don't we? We get scared. And all that fear is coming from where? Not from the situation. The situation is right here. The fear is what we anticipate may happen, may not happen, what could happen, what couldn't happen. That's all generated by what? By our mind. It's all fabricated by our mind. It is, not, it is not coming from reality. Reality is just here. Please understand the source of your fears. 
then I thought other situations. Uh, uh, I went to college uh, in the 60s. I, I was at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and that time Baltimore was a segregated city, uh, and I got involved in the civil rights movement as a college student. Uh, and uh, thinking back, I think that's a f that's the first time I can remember <laughs> uh, uh, knowing fear, uh, because it was uh, it was scary times. I mean, it was uh, you know you go on demonstrations, uh, you go on sit-ins, and things like that, and uh, there were many people who were very uh, angry at you. <laughs> And uh, there'd be crowds around, they'd be calling your names, uh, there would be physical threats, there'd be actual physical. Uh, and I can remember many situations uh, of being quite scared. Uh, and uh, many other people were scared too, because there was a real, uh, there was lots of uh, physical danger uh, very present. And yet when I look back, it was quite wonderful, uh, because what I learned was uh, that even though one can be afraid, and we were all afraid, I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> it was, I mean, I won't go into it, there were lots of situations uh, of real uh, physical danger uh, when there was nobody to protect you. Uh, it was okay. Huh? At its very worst, what? Fear is what? Uh, physical sensations that are uncomfortable in the body. Uh, but if one has a, a, a uh, an aspiration uh, that goes uh, beyond the fear, uh, then uh, the f my sense always with fear is uh, when when the fear is in front of you, it can block you, right? But if you just take the fear and you put it over here, right, then it's you know it's beside you and you just walk with it. It's no big deal. You're just afraid. So even in even in in, in a very scary f situation where there is danger, uh, you know, one can still function, and one can still be responding to uh, uh, to much more altruistic uh, aspiration in life. The fear doesn't have to block you, right? I mean, I remember years ago when I worked with vets and stuff like that. I mean, you know, you know, quote unquote heroes, right? They were all scared unless they were drugged up. You know, they were all scared, but uh, you know, uh, you know, they learned to take their fear and, and just, uh, you know, I mean, heroes are just people who, you know, are not crippled by their fear. So even in, when you're in a real fearful situation, uh, it just, that's all it is. It doesn't have to be destructive. It doesn't have to be inhibiting. Uh, I think uh, I remember an episode that was, I think, very uh, meaningful to me. Uh, I think w w that, that first summer or second summer when I was in college, uh, there was a, a, a group of people who were doing a, a community organizing project in a, in a very uh, uh, rough part of uh, Baltimore, and we all lived in a house together for the summer in this community and uh, one of the guys in the community who was very close with us uh, uh, was this Lumbee Indian. Uh, they were from uh, North Carolina who had lived to come to, to that part of Baltimore living and he was a good guy and uh, uh, but the, the culture he was in was a culture where they were uh, when they got drunk and they would often get drunk on the weekends uh, they would uh, get violent with each other and they would very often get violent with family members. You know, brothers would would go at each other. It was sort of, and uh, so uh, one night around uh, one o'clock in the morning, there's a knock at our door. I go down, and it's Shorty. He's both drunk and he's bleeding. He just got. He just had been knifed by his brother. Right. Of course, I wanted to take him to the hospital. He said no. He was tears in his eyes. He said. I want to go get my brother, and I want you to come with me. Are you my friend? It's like a moment of truth. Right? I mean, uh, for some reason, he, in, his, in his aloneness, he came to me and asked me to walk with him to confront his brother. He knew where he was. Uh, that was not something I was uh, looking forward to. 
Uh, and yet it was an interesting moment. All the reasons of not going certainly were present. But for some reason, you know, when I was 18 years old at the time, I felt this, this is a human being who is suffering. And in this moment, he needs to know he's not alone. And I said, all right, I will go with you. And I remember going, I mean, he had a big knife with him. <laughs> I thought, I, you know, it was like, you know, I'm a, I, I grew up in, in the middle class, you know, I didn't grow up like this. And I'm walking through the streets of East Baltimore, if anybody comes from Baltimore in those days, uh, there were rats everywhere. I mean, it was, it was like two, three in the morning, right? N nobody's on the street. Big rats like this are everywhere. And I'm walking with Shorty, he's got a knife, going to confront his brother. And I knew uh, that I could die that night, because I, because I know what goes on uh, with these char characters. And I was scared, but I was okay with it. It was a very, it was a very uh, interesting experience uh, because I accepted in that moment uh, that I could die and my life could end. Uh, it's not something I would have chosen for myself, uh, and I was just doing it uh, for him. And it's not like he was a close friend of mine. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it was somebody I've been working with. We've been working the community. Uh, so I think, uh, looking back on fear, I think that was a, a very powerful moment. Uh, surrendering to the possibility, or the actuality, of actually, of, of dying. And being okay with that. The good thing was, when we got to his brother's apartment, guess what? He wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to, uh, well, there, there, there are lots of episodes, uh, going up mountains, looking down, being on horseback, going up mountains, looking down, you know, uh, you know, in uh, things where you know you're just that far away from it all and, and being okay. Okay. Uh, the last thing I wanted to bring up was uh, cold water. Cold, cold water. Ice cold water. Uh, when I was young, uh, I used to go with my father to uh, the Russian baths in New York. And uh, you'd go into the baths, and afterwards there was this ice cold plunge. Ice cold. And everybody went into it. It's interesting, right? Cold water. Many of us, what? <laughs> Molly goes, what is, because why? Shocking. Shocking, cold, uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember the first time I went in, again, it was that first thing, you, you step, oh, it's like ice cold. Okay. You know, ice, ice cold, they kept it ice cold. You know, but what do you do at that moment? You know you're not going to die. And all that's going to happen is what? The body. The body is going to experience sensations. Right? Calling them uncomfortable or comfortable is something the mind projects onto that. All that is going on is what? Sensations in the body. And the body has the capacity of enduring those sensations. It is not an issue for the mind. It is not an issue for the self. Right? It's a physical sensation, isn't it? It is something for the body. And actually, uh, one finds over time that the body enjoys it. It's very bracing. It's very awakening. And that it is good for the body to give it that kind of a shock. Good for the heart and everything else. Uh, again, uh, I think that was a great lesson for me. 
because one, uh, there are many things that relate to the body that the mind and the self take over. Such as what? Everything relating to the body. What relates to the body? Death relates to the body. Sickness relates to the body. Aging relates to the body. Right? Those are all things that go on where? In the body. And they are normal to the body. And the body handles them all quite well, doesn't it? Does the body have problem with aging? <laughs> no. When you look in the mirror, it's not the body who says, Ooh, what's going on there, right? It's, it's his mind. It's his self. The body is quite fine with how it looks. Right? When the body is ready to die, it just what? It dies. There is no problem with death. What has problems with death? Your mind, yourself, that has another whole story about what? What? What's your story? Yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to die, somebody like me. <laughs> right, how did I get hooked up with this body that's impermanent? Oh, life is unfair. I mean, it's crazy. Right. I mean, how did I get hooked up with this body that doesn't look like it looked like when it was 25? I mean, you know. Right? That's this, sorry Alex, it's this, this is this crazy delusional mind that you think is normal. <laughs> it's not normal, it's abnormal. Because what's going on is going on in the body and it's okay with it. Isn't it? Sure it is. Yeah, that's what I learned at, in childhood. Yeah, the body's okay with having polio and being sick, and you know, it's okay. And if you just, you know, with the body, everything's fine. But when the mind separates from the body and, and develops what? Its agenda. I have an agenda. Right? And my agenda is different than reality. Problem. Problem. Any, uh, you know, any questions about what's been shared so far? Yes. Uh, it's been wonderful sharing, listening to you, and I was imagining when you were talking about being age three and looking out at the world through this window without having your family around, and I thought, what a unique opportunity, because we have, we have someone else who is there at the same time experiencing something very different, and that was your mother. What was she thinking? Alex, no, I don't want to go there. <laughs> Let's not distract us. <laughs> you can ask her afterwards. Yes. So, the body was okay with the polio, and the mind, evidently, you didn't about that. Because I was a child. And, 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 and children, I think, are very open and accepting. Yes. Now, on a, a more adult level, which hopefully I am from time to time, the body has a problem and issues pain. And the, Does the body have an issue with pain? I, that's what I was just about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it doesn't I, seem to. It doesn't see. It is in pain. I mean, obviously, but it is. It is a sign that the, a part of a body is in distress. But again, it's just a signal the body is is sending. I mean, could it send it from now till the end of time? It could. It could. All right. So it, again, it is the problem is who. The problem's right here. Right, there you go. And then the question I come back to with fear or fear of pain or anything of that is... Yeah, there you go. There's what you just say. There's pain, and then there's fear of pain. And, and we need to distinguish yes. very clearly that pain is a sensation in the body 
It's just a sensation. And even to call it pain is to already put it into a box. I mean, it's just a sensation. It can be hot, it can be sharp, it can be dull, it can be throbbing, it can be intermittent. I mean, there are all kinds of sensations, but that's all they are. Right? Yes. And then there is Lee, who stands outside the pain and goes what? What to do. Well, the first thing is, before you get to what to do, are you okay with accepting the reality without any fear, without any, uh, any kind of uh, despair, you know, anger? I mean, there's lots of emotions that come up around pain. But the first step is, can I accept... Again, cause and effect. I understand, uh, you know, you know what happened to my body. I understand what the cause of these, you know, it's causing sensation, and I am fully right. right. And then after that, see, there's no fear in that. There's no anger in that. There's no uh, sadness, despair in that, because there's no, there's nobody outside looking at the situation with 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 a totally different agenda, and 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 making the the the, the choice. You know, I'm, I'm either angry or I'm sad or I'm scared because what's going on is not meeting this, you know, covert, overt, conscious, unconscious agenda that I had for life, myself and my body. Once we are free of that, then it's simply, is there anything I can do? Right? Is there anything I can do? Because, uh, you know, is it comfortable? No. Is it maybe limiting my mobility or things I can do? Yes. Would I like to, uh, you know, have less pain in my life if there's a choice? You know, would I like to be able to be more... Of course. So, I mean, this is not uh, masochism, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Or, or this is not, uh, you know, grin and bear it. But it's, 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 it's no longer working from this emotional place, which is only clouding us and creating our suffering. And, 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 and so when we're clear, yeah, that's where I got to work. I got to, you know, move into this place where I'm just, you know, uh, accepting. And accepting is not an intellectual thing. It's a, it's a relaxing into. Just being present to and acknowledging, yeah, there are these sensations in my body. Yeah. And I've worked through the causation, and I've worked through the expectations and the fantasies, and you know, so there's no emotionality around it. That's where I say, uh, you know, we can be happy even if our body is ill. We have that capacity because happiness is, is, is in the mind. It's a state that is generated by the mind. And when we are not happy, I mean, I don't mean happy like in a happy, happy. I mean, just a sense of well-being, you know. I mean, some people think, oh, they read about happiness and they think, oh, I'm always supposed to have a grin on my face and, you know, lighthearted, telling jokes to everybody, you know. You know, like being in a comedy club or something. That's what happiness is. No, happiness isn't that. Happiness is a is a sense of well-being in the body mind, a kind of warmth and openness. You know, that's right. Just acceptance, openness, right? So one can be that even in difficult situations, and we know people who are like that, right? That should, that should teach us something, because we know two people can be experiencing the same thing and yet be very different. Somebody over here can be very resentful, angry, uh, depressed, uh, sad, worried, scared all the time, and somebody else could be none of that. Well, what does that tell you? It's not the sensations. It's the mind. And when we can clearly see that, there's freedom in that. Yes. You spoke of sort of being able to sit with that fear, have it here, mm -hmm. and, but not have it affect you. Mm -hmm. um, and being aware of it and all of that. How is that different from fearlessness? I think that is fearlessness. Yeah, that's that's what I mean when I said the, the question is. Uh, 
you know, is the practice of, of turning fear into fearlessness the same as uh, kind of being with the fear? Yeah, this is the process, right? Uh, fear in itself is just an emotion, okay? Uh, if we are just present to it as an emotion, as a, as a sensation, whatever it is that's arising in our body-mind, we're just present to it, right? If we look into it and see all the things we were just talking about, we understand why it's there, causing, you know, we're very objective, we understand why it's here. And there's none of that covert or overt anger, you know what I mean, all that, non, which all comes from non-acceptance. Immediately you will move into what, Kate? Fearlessness. So, you see what I'm saying? So, so it, that's what I'm saying, that the path is through it rather than around it or, or over it. You know, fearlessness is in, the, is in the heart of fear. Is that, it's, it sounds strange, but it, it's, it's really the way it is. Because once you see the empty nature of fear, that it's nothing solid, not, it doesn't, it just, you know. And then over time, as you see all the dysfunctional kind of thinking that is maintaining uh, these fears and anxieties, and you remediate them, you know, more and more you will become, fear will be less a presence in your mind. Right? Whatever well, again, it's not a problem, Kate. You see? Well, you see what I'm saying? When you, when you have this process, it's no, yeah, it will, yeah. I mean, the, you know, they say that a Buddha, pointing over here, uh, is somebody who is free of all emotional afflictions, uh, has that mind of a child. Has, a, has an empty mind. There's no thoughts, there's no conceptualization, there's no past, there's no future, there's no agenda of any kind, just totally present. Yeah. I mean, don't forget, even in the, in the Buddha's own life, uh, he faced difficult situations, right? Uh, there is that one where, <laughs> what was his name, Angulimala, that uh, serial killer, remember him? Uh, you know, he's kind of, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was going around uh, decapitating, decapitate or cutting off their fingers. He was killing people, and then he was uh, he was killing people uh, because he'd been told by somebody that if he had a necklace, let's say, of a hundred fingers from hundred or twenty, I can't remember what it was, uh, he would therefore gain some kind of magical powers. Right? So he was—I uh, call him a serial killer. He just went around killing people. Uh, and there's this great thing where, where the Buddha's walking along, uh, and Angamalala he comes after him with his sword, you know, and he's gonna, you know. Challenges him. He cuts off. He's gonna, gonna cut your head off. And the Buddha just looks at him and says, uh, "I forget what he said. What did he, he said? Something about stopping." He said, um, "Oh, oh." Uh, uh, right or something, but Orangamu says to him, "Stop." stop. And the Buddha said, I've already stopped. Why don't you stop? <laughs> and Angamala goes, what? You know, sort of like, yeah, yeah. He said, yeah, you know, why don't you stop being driven by your karma and by all your thing and, you know. Uh, and I, I suppose Angamala became a disciple of the Buddha. Uh, oh, there's another great one where uh, it's, it's a Zen. It's another one of those famous Zen act anecdotes uh, where the... Uh, uh, there's some kind of bandit chief or some I don't know. He's he's, he's you know pillaging and raping in the countryside and uh, comes to the monastery and uh, you know he and his crew uh, go into the monastery. They're gonna uh, steal and all that and uh, and he and I, I don't know maybe everyone's fled. I don't know. I don't remember the exact story. It doesn't matter. Uh, so anyhow, uh, and he and he comes into the abbot's room, the, you know the master's room, and the master just sitting there. All right. He pulls out his sword. He goes, do you know who I am? I'm a man who can cut off a head with one, right, with one uh, swipe. And the master looked at him and said, do you know who I am? I am someone who can have his head cut off with one swipe. <laughs> Just like that. Maybe to add to that, we could say uh, the, 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 the guy says, "Can you? You know, I'm I am somebody who can run you through with one blade and not be afraid." And the master says, "Well, I am somebody who can be run through with a blade and not be afraid." It's, it's the same thing. 
find. And it is why, actually, that uh, the samurai used to train in Zen. Whether that's a good thing or not, I mean, that's, a, that's something else. But it's, again, to have that a capacity not to be afraid. And, uh, yeah, again, death. You know, there are things... This world is impermanent, isn't it? This body of ours is subject to sickness, old age, and will die. Everybody we love is subject to impermanence. They are subject to sickness, old age, and death. Uh, everything we have uh, is subject to impermanence, right? Our relationships, our things, our homes, our jobs, our, our, uh, our savings, you know, it's all, right? And knowing that, and that's the truth. And so you, so you can see, uh, if you don't really understand that deeply, you can see a chronic kind of worry can always be present. Because the truth is, yes, it's all impermanent, and anything and everything is subject to change, and everything we have could uh, change or be taken away in an instant. Right? And that could cause a self that wanted things not to change, that had its own agenda, Lee, that had its own agenda, that had nothing to do with reality. Right? Because the nature of reality is what? Impermanence. That is, the, that is just the nature of reality. Everything changes. Nothing is solid. Everything is subject to causes and conditions. Therefore, everything, uh, everything and anything will change, including us, our thoughts, our feelings. I mean, everything is like that, right? right? How, many, how many thoughts have you had since you came to retreat last night? I mean, how many thoughts have you had? How many mind states have you been through? I mean, you can't keep track of them. But the interesting thing is, they just keep changing, don't they? They don't stay for a moment. Right? They don't stay for a moment. That should tell you something. You know? Why put your trust in something so unstable as a thinking mind? Jesus. <laughs> Danger, danger. I mean, I mean, you know, I'd be scared of that. <laughs> I mean, if you want something to worry about, or want something to be concerned and anxious about, be concerned about your, you know, your thinking mind and the th and the things it tells you. And then five minutes later, it'll tell you the totally opposite. Right? You know, you know, one moment you'll be happy, one moment you won't. One things will be good. Be, my life's great. My life's terrible. I love my boss. I hate my boss. What a good life I have. What a terrible life I have. You know. I mean, it's like, uh, got, a, got the greatest partner in the world. How did I ever end up with this person? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know. Can we listen to this thing? Endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. That's why it's so important that we stop and see clearly what's going on. Yes, Maria. What about the issue of mirror neurons? This, I mean, here, the state of the mind that, of people that are close to us. I think uh, that story with the, that serial killer meeting Buddha was because Buddha's mind was so strong, ultimate strength in evenness, that the mirror neurons helped that serial killer also to gain some evenness. But the opposite can be true too, you know, it depends on the strength of evenness of my mind. That uh, I remember from school, for instance, when there was a big exam and I thought I was prepared and I was nervous, I walk into the classroom and there is a nervous energy. Mm -hmm. Instantly it jumps over and I talk, you know, and start to freak just like everyone. Okay, look. That's why, that's why that. Right? Yeah, because if you're looking around, like Alex over here, if, if you're looking around for your cues of normalcy to the abnormal, you know, yeah. Yeah, one, that's why, <laughs> yeah, that's why, again, we're jumping ahead, you know, that's why, you know, we need Buddha Dharma Sangha. That's, you know, you hear about the refuges. 
you know, so in this unstable world, in this world where things are, you know, what can I trust? What can I have confidence with? You know, you know where, you know, if if there's no stability out here, where is there stability? Well, there's stability in these things, right? You see, trusting the teacher, trusting the mentor, trusting the tradition, trusting the teachings. Oh, because they help me, you know, they provide stability. They provide consistency, right? Right? They give me the capacity that when I walk into the classroom, even though everybody's freaking out, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, you know. Why? Because I'm in my body. And my mind is relaxed. And I'm just moving in the present moment. I'm not attending, you know, it's like when I said in the beginning, you know, if you're here watching everybody else, you know, what, what's that going to get you? Right? Maria. Right? I mean, unfortunately, this was not taught in your school. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, but wouldn't it have been wonderful if somebody said, you know, Maria, you know, uh, do some relaxation and calming the mind before, uh, you know, you know, just put everything down and don't study up to the last minute and just calm your mind and really just be in yourself. And, you know, when you walk into the classroom, be aware of your feet touching the floor like in walking meditation. Don't look around. Don't attend to anybody else. You know, just be, you know, you know, you know, within yourself. Right. Would have been a very different experience, wouldn't it? And, and you know, that's not like that's that profound. I mean, you could teach children that. Right? But again, there's nobody, you know, our educational system just puts things in the mind, shovels information into the mind, but it never has anything to tell children about how to use your mind, you know, how to take care of your mind. You know, that's, it's like, that's, that's the big thing. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. Yeah, so we need, uh, uh, that's why we need to make these teachings and practices our own. They have to go deeper, and I know uh, Angie and Darlene will help us in the next 24 hours to take it from here into here. So we know it. Right? We can, we know it in our body. We know it deep in our mind. It's our, and it becomes our truth. You know, we, we oh yeah. When it's your truth, it doesn't matter what everybody else does. Does it? When you know something to be true. Huh? Even Alex, who's so affected by abnormal people. I mean, Alex, if you walked into into this in, in, into the room and everybody was uh, drinking poison, and they said, "Here, Alex, have 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 a shot." <laughs> And Alex knew it was poison. What would he say? Well, they're all doing it, you know. It must be the normal thing to do. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Right? We go, no, of course I wouldn't. Right? Of course I wouldn't. That's crazy. But yet we do it all the time, don't we? Yeah. Other, other questions? Just a couple of things before we end, uh, because I know Angie and Darlene will help in a very practical way. Fear primarily takes place in the world of imagination. Okay, fear takes place in the world of imagination. When we are fearful, right? And again, now I'm not talking about, you know, the saber-toothed tiger coming at you. I want to get that clear. We're talking about the other 99% of it, which is just imagined. Is that clear? Because again, uh, for those of you into science and all that, the amygdala stuff and all that, uh, you know, that's ancient stuff. You know, that's saber-toothed tiger stuff. You know, that's, that's, that's going about in the forest when they're all kind of dangerous and, you know, everybody was slugging everybody and hitting each other over the head with logs and running each other through all the time and wild animals were, you know what I mean? It was like, uh, you know, that's not it for us here in Tampa and St. Pete and Florida, right? 
So most of our anxieties and fear are imagining imagination. We're imagining scenarios. What if this happens, and what if that happens, and what if this happens to my children, and what if this happens to me, and what if I don't get this, and or what if I do get that, or, you know, what am I going to do, and how, you know, blah, 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 you know what I mean, I can't handle it, or it'd be too much, or that'd be ter that's all imagine, that's all going, that's in the world of imagination. Is that clear? As well as w with fear, there's also a lot of uh, visualization as opposed to other things. We, we kind of, many people actually see it. You know, when I used to work with people who had uh, fear of flying phobia. I mean, can you imagine what these crazy people did? <laughs> You know, you know. I mean, I mean, I mean. They'd get on the plane or think about getting a plane, and they'd imagine the plane going down. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> that's what you do? Oh, well, you know, that's like, you know, imagining the plane going down is not the same as the plane going down in reality, is it? No. I just want to make that clear. We are all in the same. <laughs> make sure. Make sure we're all in the same consensual reality here. I mean, is that clear? That's not real, right? You know, but our poor bodies and our poor emotional system don't know that, right? We, we, we impose such misery on our emotions, all right? Because we do what? We imagine these things and they think it's really happening. Plane's going down. <laughs> Time to get terrified. <laughs> right. Is that is that clear? You know, we do it all the time. We 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 get our poor body mind angry and resentful about things that have happened, you know, hours ago. We just keep replaying it and we get the same emotion. Fear, play, we replay it in our imagination. Right? I mean, people do these things. They, they have children, and they imagine terrible things happening to their children. I mean, is that sick? <laughs> I mean, why, why, why would you do that? <laughs> you know, why? Can you see? It's, just, it's, it's all imaginary. It's not real. Okay, a lot of nodding heads. Good. Okay. So... Um, any, I think I've talked enough. Uh, again, the talking is not to uh, educate, simply, or neither is it to entertain. Uh, it is to help you in your own search, investigation within your own body-mind. There is nothing I have said today and shared with you today that everybody here cannot simply and easily understand. Is that clear? I mean, did, did anything I say sound so profound, you know, that you've got to be like Alex and get a, a medical degree and understand all the science of the like, amygdala, <laughs> the reptilian brain and all that nonsense? <laughs> <laughs> is that clear? You, nobody needs a degree in here, in psychology, medical, anything, okay? It's all so simple. You don't agree? No, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> when you were talking about all these imaginary fears. Yes. Well, these imaginary scenarios that produce the fear, yes. But they affect your mind. Yes. So, then the mind is not there anymore. You're exactly. So then the only thing you have left is your body. It has to be. And the body isn't fearful, because that can accept what happens, right? Right. So, then, so get the mind, get the imagination, just let's concentrate on our body, right? I think that sounds good. <laughs> Just be, yeah, because your body, and when I say body, I include seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, that all is occurring where? Yeah. In our body. And our body is always in the present. I mean, can you see in the future with your eyes? No, 
we can only see what's in front of us. It's always, it's always in the present. We only hear sounds right? that are going on right now, smell, taste. Yeah. So the more we live in the present, the more we're grounded in reality, the less we will go off on these flights of fancy. Again, somebody might say, well, a lot of my flights of fancy or my imaginative stuff is, is not filled with anxiety or fear. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a, in some, I'm, I'm Walter Mitty. I'm a great hero. I'm saving the world. You know, that's my thing. Yeah, you're right. The problem with that is if your mind has a proclivity to fantasy, it will go in the other direction too. You know, that's why we have to give up both and learn just to be in the present. And we, our mind has wonderful capacities, but it has to be grounded in reality. If it is not grounded in reality and you, we just let it uh, spin on its own conditioning, you, you, we all know what will happen because it's what happens. This mind cannot be left untended. Right? There was a great Zen master, somebody came to him and said, well, what is your practice? And he said, my practice is tending the ox. The ox here meaning the mind. Oh, and the guy, the guy said, well, uh, what do you do? How do you tend the ox? He said, well, you know, uh, and again, or the buffalo, it's like if you've been to Asia, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I keep it on the road, and every time it starts going off to the right, uh, wanting to get into the fields, I give it a little tug, and I bring it back to center. And when it goes off to the left and wants to get into something, I give it a little tug and bring it back to center. That's, that's what I do. That's my practice, tending the ox. But many of us are ox because it has never been tended. It is not used to. <laughs> Somebody tugging on the reins, right? So we need to, that's why we train. We need to train our ox so it becomes responsive. So good, we will stop for today. So please have a good day of practice. Uh, whatever comes, be open to it. Uh, and just keep watching yourself. Uh, again, there are people here who have been on many retreats. Many people here are new retreats. Uh, first time, it's, it's all fine. Okay, don't judge yourself. Uh, just be open and follow the instructions and everything will be fine. And so I will uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs>